Welcome to the Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva, and today we're going to get some insight into esports and graduate programs at the college level. My guest today is David Hedlund. He is the Associate Professor, Graduate Program and Director and Chairperson and Division of, of Sports Management for St. John's University. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, so uh, usually I start my guests uh, where they went to college. So uh, where'd you go to school? Ab absolutely. So it's a little bit of a, a, a ride. So I started off at St. Olaf College, um, you know, several decades ago. So small liberal arts college brought to fame by the Golden Girls. <laughs> Rose is from this college of St. Olaf, uh, city of St. Olaf. And so that's, that's, you know, that's how I think many people know St. Olaf College. Um, after college, I went to Japan, um, utilizing the JET program uh, to teach, uh, and also um, played soccer over there a little bit, um, did a little bit of high school coaching and whatnot. Came back to the United States, uh, started a graduate program at Northeastern University, um, coached both of their men's and women's soccer teams there um, and was there for two years doing graduate work then went to Fairleigh Dickinson to continue my graduate study so just up the road here from Princeton uh, a, a little ways finished up my degree there went to Taiwan uh, was a university instructor at a university called Ming Chuan University and, and cool. some other opportunities in Taiwan then I went back to school here in the United States, went to Tallahassee, Florida, to Florida State, got my PhD in sport management, focusing on marketing, consumer behavior, uh, and um, statistics, uh, and then uh, got a job at uh, St. John's. Wow. And so I've been there, I think this is my, going into my ninth year at St. John's. So wow. yeah, an associate uh, professor up there, teach um, analytics, marketing, um, you know, do quite a bit of work in esports today. So yeah, I've got my hands in, in a lot of different activities. Yeah, absolutely. So just to go back a little bit, because the, the name of the show is Secrets of College Planning, so it's, it's usually from high school to college. When did, when did you start thinking about going to college? Was it uh, freshman year, high school, senior year? When did it all begin for you? Probably like many of your viewers, I have an older sibling. Uh, and so I probably started thinking about college when she started thinking about it because we did family trips to universities all, all over the country, I would say, mostly on the East Coast. I remember uh, trips to Swarthmore, to Duke, to, to other places. Ironically, she went to St. Olaf. Oh. So I, I followed her, you could, I guess you could say, um, somewhat blazing my own path, but certainly I, we both went to the same uh, undergraduate institution. So. Um, I started thinking uh, with, m with my older sibling, but a lot of it for me came down to the college visits. Mm. Um, that the, these, when, it, you know, when I think back, what were the key factors about why I chose St. Olaf over some of the other places, my parents' alma mater and other um, schools and universities? A lot of it came down to the, the actual going to the university, staying overnight, visiting, taking some classes. Um, you know, at St. John's, we offer the same type of opportunity. If, you know, students are on campus and there are classes that they can go and attend, you know, we're always inviting them for these. And I think many universities, they, they have that type of policy where you could stay over, you know, uh, attend some classes and, and get, in a, get a sense of what would the experience be. And, and for me at the time, my parents were living on the East Coast and Minnesota was a good distance. Uh, so it, it gave me some freedom and, and some opportunities that would not have come otherwise if I'd stayed at home, for example, and you know lived at my parents' house and gone to the University of Rhode Island, which would have been the closest university for me at the time. So, so uh, St. John's University, give the give um, the audience what St. John's University is all about, where it is. G give them a little sense of St. John's a University. Ab absolutely. So. Back in the mid 80s, when probably a lot of the parents who may be watching this with their kids or went to school, St. John's was really well known for men's basketball. Chris Mullen, um, you know, reaching the, the Final Four, many of these type of activities. We still have an excellent sports program. In fact, sport management, that's, that's what we study, and we're a very big and robust program at the university. Uh, but the university today is very metropolitan. Its main campus is located in Queens. Uh, we have another campus in Staten Island. We have a third campus out on Long Island, and then we have international campuses in Paris and Rome. Yeah. Uh, in this, at the, on the sport manage, for the sport management program, we also have partnerships with universities around the world. We have a lot of students coming from all over the world, coming and studying within the program. 
Uh, and so it's, uh, it's actually quite a large university, about 20,000 total students uh, between the undergraduate and graduate levels spread out uh, amongst uh, uh, many different colleges. We've got a law school, um, a business school, we're in professional studies, a college of education, a liberal arts college, uh, and a pharmacy college. Mm -hmm. And so the pharmacy college is, is probably when we talk about you know which programs are really well known certainly the biggest program and law program there's a lot of distinguished individuals who've graduated and who will be graduating from those programs but today the pharmacy program is, is really big and kind of pertinent to, to to sport management we've just announced in fact we're breaking ground in the next um month or two on on a new kind of updating one of our buildings to include more health sciences programs. Wow. And so certainly I think the, the COVID-19 epidemic, pandemic has caused us to, you know, what kinds of programs are really important for population in general. And so one of St. John's missions being a Vincentian and a Catholic university is, you know, helping our fellow man. And so part of this is so, you know, are there opportunities to, drain, to train physician's assistants and, mm -hmm. and medical personnel and, and individuals of this sort? And so, you know, St. John's is moving forward with some of these type of opportunities, which are really exciting, I think, is, especially for sport management, because, for example, sports, the it, underpinning is a lot of the athletic training and, and physical training and conditioning and some of these types of activities. And so we haven't been able to, to, to really provide some of these internally from within the university. And so some of these new programs are going to be really exciting for us in, in, in sports and athletics. So now, the vision of sports management, you also talked about eSports. Can you give us uh, an example of what eSports is about? Or how, how did it come about at St. John's University? Yeah, ab absolutely. So um, for the younger viewers, the, those who are bound for college soon, probably the word eSports is, is very common, very well understood to them. This is going to be competitions in... Uh, Call of Duty and League of Legends and Rocket League and Super Smash Brothers and FIFA and Madden and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, but it's these type of competitions. Many of these type of competitions are broadcasted on YouTube and on Twitch. These are two very popular places where, they're li where these events are live streamed to audiences uh, around the world. And the, those certainly by, are by no means the only two places in which you can find uh, live esports. In fact, there are television stations, just like the one we're in right now, that are broadcasting esports events from, from locations all over the world. This also, because of COVID-19, esports was really well positioned to kind of sustain itself by moving to an, a fully online model mm -hmm. throughout the last year and a half or so. And so today, sport management programs are increasingly looking at sports and esports. Um, I had the fortunate opportunity of uh, gaming, if you will, playing video games, going back uh, many, many, many decades, probably to the at least the 80s, if not before then. Uh, and so it's now something where esports is competitive video gaming. In the beginning, many of the first competitions, they'd line up 20 computers or consoles next to each other, and you know who can play the longest, who can get the highest score. Things of this sort. That was the that was the advent of esports. Mm -hmm. Today, there are, as you would see with any traditional sport, there are similar esports type of competitions. You know, with United States and overseas, internationally based organizations in which are sponsoring teams in one or more esports games. And so, you know, here in the United States, uh, teams probably 100 Thieves is one of the most um, well-known uh, groups. Um, FaZe Clan is another one. And so these are organizations that are sponsoring uh, and organizing teams in many different esports and then competing in different types of competitions. And so, for example, here in the New York City area, uh, we have an organization called Andbox. Um, originally, this was owned by the former Mets owners. It's, uh, it's kind of funded through a venture capital firm now. Uh, and the, so the two of the professional esports teams, uh, one in the game of Overwatch, uh, New York Excelsior, and one in the game, uh, game uh, Call of Duty, uh, in the Call of Duty League, that's the New York Subliners. Uh, these are two professional teams that compete uh, in, the, in this geographical area. Hmm. Now certainly in the last year and a half we haven't seen a whole lot. 
Um, but for example, there were events that were planned at the Hammerstein Ballroom and and locations. And in fact, um, you know, if I give a shout out to another university that uh, you know we have a really good relationship with Rutgers, you know they've they've spent they've invested a lot of resources into esports. Uh, and so, you know, St. John's, Rutgers, Seton Hall, a lot of our peer institutions here in the area, we've all kind of gotten on this this esports bandwagon. Uh, esports at St. John's, it started um, 2018. So, um, the Big East announced um, we are a Big East member uh, that uh, they were going to do some some testing of esports opportunities. And uh, I follow Big East Sports on Twitter. And I saw it, and so immediately I saw it, and I started contacting my colleagues. And many people were kind of like, I don't know anything about this. And, and so, you know, to some extent it was, okay, well, no one's doing a whole lot. There was a student organization that did a little bit, but there wasn't much going on. And so, uh, you know, I, was, uh, I, was, I had already been approved to become a tenured professor. And as any professors know, once you get tenure, it, opens up some opportunities for you to do things that maybe normally one m m might not do. And so, you know, I, I've spent the last um, three and a half years, um, you know, working with St. John's on many different esports projects. And so, you know, we're really fortunate, I think, at St. John's. We've got three different opportunities right now for students at, at St. John's. So number one, obviously, is through the Big East. Uh, the Big East has partnered with a group called the Electronic Gaming Federation, EGF. Um, there's quite a few universities on the, on the East Coast who work with EGF. EGF, uh, their job is to kind of create competitions. And so last year there were five games in which they were do holding competitions. And so that was that's kind of the, the, the pinnacle of, of eSports where, for example, <coughs> excuse me, our League of Legends team is one of the best teams in the United States. And so, uh, you know, they were competing to try to get a berth into the national championships wow. last year. Uh, you know, so that was that was really exciting to, 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 to be a part of that. Underneath or parallel to, uh, we have a, an organization called the Gaming and Emerging Technology Club, the GET Club, where we get fill in uh, an active verb, get um, learning, get gaming. Uh, there's all sorts of, of cute things that we've come up with that, that we pair with this. And so we work with an organization called the uh, East Coast Athletic Conference, the ECAC. Uh, so the ECAC is actually quite big. This year, I believe they're thinking 150 universities, give or take, will be participating. They've got 10 or 11, maybe even up to 12 eSports in which students can compete. Uh, and so this is kind of more of it's it's competitive, but you know a little bit more relaxed, mm. um, you know, kind of a, a, a com between colleges, but more for fun. Yeah. Uh, and so we've been facilitating these opportunities. Um, for example, in the spring, uh, one of our sport management undergraduate majors was the FIFA champion. Um, and so that was really exciting as as he competed and he he actually knocked off the prior champion. and so, um, you know, that was really exciting to be a part of some of this. And then even beyond that, uh, we've got kind of like recreational, intramural eSports activities. Um, there is a group that's, um, the name of the group is Meta. Uh, it was formerly known as the Otaku Brigade. Anyone uh, who's into Japanese anime knows what Otaku is. And so this organization, they do gaming and other kinds of culture and, and animation and some of these types of things. And so we work with them to hold in-house kind of competitions. So, you know, on a Friday night, let's get a bunch of people together who want to compete in some, some for fun kinds of activities. Well, you know, we've got several different spaces that we use on campus that are kind of gaming centered with top of the line equipment and, and so holding competitions and things like this. And, and so, you know, from there, we've got all sorts of outlets. Our Overwatch team, you know, competes in several different um, opportunities and competitions held and fostered by some of the professional teams. And, and so, yeah, there's so many different opportunities, even to the point now where, you know, I think a lot of parents, they might see coding camps for kids that are going on in the summer. And so now, you know, you know can we hold esports camps and, and things like that? Uh, you know, I have a, a, um, an elementary school aged um, son, and so he plays Minecraft, and so we play Minecraft together. And um, so, if we're doing things that are you know community based, I'll, I'll be with him there to you know to, to keep an eye on him and make sure he's safe and, and some of these kind of things. 
um, because the internet can be a little bit of a, a crazy place from time to time. But yeah, if he's just if it's just offline, you know, he's got his own world. He's built some um, roller coasters through Minecraft through his Minecraft world, and you know, built the tallest towers and the the the, the lowest pits and and all sorts of things. And so a lot of these activities are are really great for students, which. You know, I, I think a, a question that many parents ask me, um, you know, when I'm on panels or, or, or wherever, you know, I may have a chance to interact with them is talk to us a little bit about like, what are the outcomes? Like, okay, you know, I, I worry that maybe if my, my kids are playing some of these games, maybe they might be more prone to violence, um, you know, but I, I'm hearing, yeah, um, Elon Musk is talking about, yeah, he's looking to hire gamers at Tesla. And so, you know, there's all of these mixed messages out there. Can you, like, give us a sense? Like, well, like, what, what's your perspective? And so, for the last three and a half years, uh, you know, a lot of it research funded by St. John's University and other, other universities, New York Institute of Technology, some, some other partners, a, a DNA company, Athletic Genetics, that does um, um, blood and saliva testing in order to work with athletes and, like, figure out, like, nutrition, some of these kinds of opportunities. And so, some really exciting things that we're kind of starting to, to learn. Um, you know, using what many of us are trained at as, as academics to do, you know, empirically sound research. And so, you know, one of the first messages I'm often explaining to parents is, yeah, a lot of the information you might hear about, you know, playing video games, that's, you know, that's a recipe for disaster that your kids are going to be more, more violent and some of these kind of things. Yeah, there, there really is no empirical proof of, of that. Although certainly, when kids are playing, we see that they get excited, um, and they're getting they're getting energized, and, and some of these kind of things. Do they want to go out and hurt other people? No. You know, do we sometimes see them for fun? Yeah. You know, I play Mortal Kombat. I want to try to, you know, do some. Yeah. There, there certainly is some of this impact, but it's not turning them into, you know, someone who's going to go out and do, you know, some, 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 yeah. some very bad behaviors. So, so tell me, uh, students that want to get involved in esports, how mm -hmm. do you find them? Do they, do they come to the university first and then you find them, or do you look in the high schools? Yeah. So, in fact. You can go on Twitch and on YouTube today, and you can find students, you know, as, you know, children, you know, five, six, seven years old, you know, who are probably in the background, their parents are watching over them, who are live streaming their events. There are some of them who are excellent. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, several years ago, the 2019 Fortnite World Championship won by a 16-year-old from Pennsylvania. And so there's a lot of young people who, I'm sure as they're thinking about college choices, they're already gaming. Whether they're doing it officially with their schools, whether they're just finding you know, local land centers or uh, places where they can do um, augmented and virtual reality, or you know, if they've got um, technology at their home that they can use to game, they're already gaming. Elementary school students, they're already gaming. Uh, in fact, today, you know, games like Robolux, they're you know listed on stock exchanges and things like that so you can invest in these companies and there are many students they're learning how to code because in roblox and in minecraft there are opportunities to actually learn how to do programming and so when elon musk is talking about yeah i want to find gamers to hire at tesla a lot of it is Stu students and, and individuals, they have the opportunity to learn some of these programming, some of these computer skills um, through some of these games. And so, you know, whether it's hand-eye coordination, whether it's understanding how do you build some of these games. Um, for example, uh, the game Fortnite is built on the platform called Unreal Engine. And so the Unreal Engine, there are courses that you can take which teach you how do you program, how do you do 3D programming for games, how do you build games. Um, in fact, my son and I, um, he, he's got an iPad from his elementary school, and they have coding games there. And so he, he comes to me and says, I mean, obviously he and I game together, so he, you know, he comes and, you know, Dad, you know, I, I can't figure out how do you code this? How do you come up with the, the, the code and programs? And so, you know, he and I sit down and we, we talk through it. And so, okay, so we need to create a sequence here of repetitive events that are going to occur that we want to fill 
space by space by space, or we want to do this diagonal. So it's going to be one over, one down, one over, one down. And so how do we program this? One over, one down, fill. One over, one down, fill. If we're trying to make a diagonal line. And so we'll talk about how we do some of these programming types of activities. And so this is the basis of many of the new technologies that are being developed, whether it's video games, whether it's virtual reality, augmented reality, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's machine learning, many of these types of skills that parents, that students are hearing about, hey, this is the future economy, this is the future of employment, these are the kind, this is the basis of where a lot of students are starting to learn. So, so at the college level, is there any other monies uh, available for esports? Are they doing anything like that? Or yeah, so, so if we had done this interview on June thirtieth, <laughs> my answer would be different than it is today. So a month later. So obviously on January first, there were some major changes that came to college sports via the NCA. So specifically in the areas of name, image, and likeness, also known as NIL. And so essentially, what the changes that were made, and of course these changes are still evolving, you know, a few weeks from now it could be slightly different. Um, but today, student athletes at colleges and universities, they are allowed to monetize in a very general sense uh, their name, image, and likeness. And so we see college athletes signing opportunities to do commercials and branding. And you know, there are companies like Open Doors that um, even high school athletes can, can, can work with in order to try to leverage some of their name, image, and likeness. And so because of this, this has opened up money in college sports. Now, can college athletes be paid? Well, the answer to that is not directly no. They are, there is still a scholarship system. But then probably to, to the question you're asking, are there scholarships in esports? The answer there is yes. Uh, if you were then to follow up with how many universities have them, uh, there are probably over 100, I would, I would probably estimate 100 to 150, that have dedicated eSports scholarships. But of course, I'm sure some of the other financial aid um, experts who've come and been on the show, they've probably talked about, yeah, I mean, we can you know, move monies around. And, and so there, there's all sorts of creative ways in which universities are, 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 are moving monies in order to try to, to supplement. In fact, at, at St. John's, because we are a Vincentian and Catholic institution, um, you know, we try very hard. In fact, you know, many students, they're getting 50% or more of their tuition in, in scholarships and, and other types of opportunities. If you're a top student, you could probably get your entire uh, education paid for at a place like St. John's. And so, you know, many universities, they have really robust systems. One of the things that we've seen, and of course, since we started esports at St. John's, you know, tracking who are these students, what are they majoring in, and of course, you know, in the beginning, the first 500 or so students, 60% of them plus were coming out of STEM programs, and so we can see that the science, the technology, engineering, math, pharmacy. Um, you know, accounting, many of these types of programs, that these are hotbeds for students who have this interest in esports and technology. And so, to a lot of it, it makes sense. The T in STEM is technology. So, you know, it, it makes a lot of logical sense. But certainly, even in sport management, I mean, this was the second most popular major. And so, for example, I, I mean, for me a, a, as an athlete, going back into my athletic career and my coaching career, yeah, many of us, we've been playing video games, you know, whether it's to pass the time, whether it's, you know, we're going on trips, road trips, overseas trips, whatever. And so we're supposed to stay in the hotels. What are we going to do? Yeah. We're gaming. And of course, today, we have the opportunity to game on our phones, game on our iPads, bring really powerful computers, gaming computers with us, and we can game and stream while we're, while we're on trips and things like this. So... Well, Lots of great opportunities. Well, we're, we're coming to the end of our show, and I uh, usually ask my guests, uh, what advice do you want to give to the parents and the students that want to come to St. John's University, might want to play eSports? What advice do you want to give them? Yeah, I, so just first uh, kind of a general piece of advice. 
You know, today there's a lot of efforts that universities are going through in order to try to be as transparent as possible about cost of attendance, if you're going to live on campus, a lot of these kind of things. One of the things I always, when parents are talking to me at St. John's at recruiting events and things like that, is, you know, talk to all, talk to all the financial aid people. Try to make sure that you have the best possible financial comparison, so you can make the proper choices for your family. Certainly, we hear a lot. I mean, I, you know, to get my PhD, I took out student loans, and uh, I still have. Uh, you know, even today, as I sit here, I have one master's degree loan that's left. Um, that I, you know, I've got my last few thousand dollars, but it's pegged prime, so it's cheaper than my mortgage. So, you know, there's no reason for me to to pay it off unless, you know, the interest rate goes up. Um, but you know, getting the best possible information and the most complete and thorough kind of accounting of what's a university going to cost. After that, it's kind of a. a an examination into the programs. So at St. John's, for example, our undergraduate program is uh, more than 300 students. Our graduate program is 70 to 80 students. And so, you know, we are a rather big program compared to the other sport management programs that are around. And so, you know, looking at the programs, looking at the faculty members who are teaching, you know, for example, we, we purposely employ a lot of adjunct faculty because we're in New York City. So we can have individuals and, and projects and opportunities with the WNBA, with the New York Yankees, with the Mets, you know, with the Jets and the Giants and the Red Bull and, and New York City Football Club and, and with the, the, the Lizards and Major League Lacrosse and with, um, you know, international, you know, the Long Island Ducks. Uh, and the Brooklyn Cyclones, and so we can have lots of relationships and even have individuals coming from these organizations and coming in teaching classes or talking to students. And so there's lots of these type of opportunities that, that a place like St. John's provides. So those are probably the, the, the two areas, I would say, making sure that you're getting a good accounting and then also really looking into some of the programs. You know, who's teaching? You know, where are they getting jobs? You know, who do they have the opportunity? I mean, I don't have the opportunity to force Janie and Johnny, the, the students in my classes, to, to do anything. Mm -hmm. I can certainly try to motivate them by grades. They're not doing what they're supposed to. They may get lower grades and so try to motivate them, some of these things. But so much of it comes uh, uh, is the responsibility of the students. Take advantage of the opportunities. The doors are opened by the universities. The, the students, though, they've got to walk through them. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Anthony. Pleasure to be here. So you've been watching The Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva. Until next time.